The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being with me today. Uh, good uh, morning to uh, those of us uh, uh, down in the uh, uh, in Queensland, at least. I think it's good afternoon for most of the rest of the states that have daylight saving, and of course, it's good afternoon to our friends across the ditch in New Zealand. Great roll up today, folks. Uh, how's the volume? Can you all hear me all right? Could someone type in the uh, question box, please? Here we are. Norbert, he's, he's usually first. Good morning to you, Norbert. Um, I guess it's cold where you are up there still, mate. Uh, probably very cold. Um, and uh, I can tell you that it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, well, summer day, I guess. Uh, 20, minus 25 with Norbert up in Canada. Oh, my goodness. Benjamin, uh, welcome. Uh, Benjamin uh, P is a new uh, member of the Daniel Code. Great to have you with us. Of course, my old friend uh, Hank down in uh, the Hunter Valley is always uh, on the job. Uh, hope you're well down there, Hank. Uh, grandfather of the year, Hank. His son, uh, Justin, a wonderful little baby. Uh, well down. Yeah, Norbert, minus 25. Honestly, there must be a reason. I don't know what it is. Uh, I can tell you it's uh, summer down under, uh, short sleeve weather, the pool is looking uh, fabulous, the beach is looking even better, uh, the Pacific Ocean is as blue as blue can be and it's a beautiful clear day, uh, it's wonderful and, it, <laughs> and Joel from Vero Beach is with us as well, good on you mate, 82 degrees at Vero Beach in Florida, thank you Joel, <laughs> uh, I'm with you son. Okay, so uh, <laughs> don't have to worry about algae in the pool. <laughs> quite right, quite right, quite right. Um, I put in a pool here. It's quite a big pool uh, for my uh, children um, who swore that they were going to use it uh, every day all the time. And, uh, of course, that hasn't happened. I can tell you anyone who's thinking of putting a pool in at their house, uh, don't. Uh, they're a pain in the neck uh, and they're more trouble than they're worth. Uh, Monty, good to have you with us. Thank you for posting. Um, okay, so uh, lots of uh, people with it. Uh, Albert, uh, great. Thank you, Albert. I've um, got your message about your uh, subscription. I'll get around to sending you an invoice uh, today. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let me see. That's that. Andrew's with us. Uh, Benjamin, as I said, a new member. Wonderful to have you with us, uh, Brandon, uh, Carol. Carol, we don't have many ladies uh, with us, uh, and uh, when we do have them, I particularly like to welcome them. Uh, what said, oh, this is John down in Coffs Harbour. I'm just about to build a pool for the kids. Uh, good luck, mate. <laughs> I mean, the kids do love it. The problem is they grow up and they uh, go away <laughs> if you're left with the pool. Uh, but I love it. I, I swim a bit. Uh, uh, and uh, so anyway, Carol, uh, lovely to have you, special lady, welcome to uh, the ladies of whom we have very few, Deborah, uh, great to have you with us as well, uh, Graham over in uh, New Zealand, uh, mate, I apologise for not getting your uh, uh, video uh, tutorial done, but I'm glad to tell you I've done it, uh, it went off uh, to Terry yesterday, it's being rendered, as soon as it's uh, finished, I'll get it to you uh, uh, likely later today or tomorrow. You'll have it uh, for the weekend anyway. Uh, great having you with us, George, also, of course. Uh, Hank, uh, famous. Hank's been with us for years and years. You're one of our uh, longest standing members, Hank. Uh, it's grand, and you've done a couple of tutorials, as is your son. Uh, John's with us. Jeff, he's a tutorial guy. Great to have you with us, Jeff. Hope you're well. Haven't heard from you for a while. Jeff also. Joel, as I say, uh, uh, in uh, Vero Beach, John, down in Coffs Harbour, beautiful part of the world. Mark L., a great stalwart, he's at all of these uh, uh, webinars, he's done a tutorial. Uh, uh, his famous words, it, saved my, it changed my life, it changed my life, that's how he summed it up. Uh, Michael M., the dentist up in Chicago, great to have you with us. Uh, Mark, haven't heard from you for a long time. Glad you're still with us. Hope your trading's still fabulous. If not, do another Daniel Code tutorial. Uh, we'll get you up to date with um, uh, trading uh, time. Uh, the Murph, of course, he's a stalwart. Wonderful to have you with us. Monty, Nathan, uh, Ned, uh, 
boy, we've got a lot of people here. Peter Mack is the uh, short-term trading whiz. Uh, let me see, keep going here, right at, they're all coming in. Sean, he's down in Adelaide. Good to have you with us, Sean. Sue up in Cairns, one of our famous, famous Daniel Code tutorial uh, lady. She's a lovely lady. She came to me years ago and said, I've been trading for 20 years and I've never had a winning month, uh, but <laughs> I'm still trying to learn. So she did a Daniel Code tutorial. She's never looked back. It's uh, been fantastic for her. Uh, Toddy over there in California, he's a great old steward. He's uh, been with us for a very, very long time and great to have you with us. Trevor, of course. Um, that's uh, great uh, to have all of you with us. Wonderful. Uh, and more coming in all the time. Uh, okay, so a very important, um, a very important uh, tutorial today, folks. Um, and so let's uh, uh, get right on with it. Uh, uh, I hope you're all uh, managing to hang in with this dreadful, dreadful COVID thing. Um, we're so blessed down here, of course. Uh, Australia and uh, our compatriots New Zealand, uh, which is a most beautiful little country just across the Tasman Sea, not far, we, we, we call it the ditch, um, but uh, just about a three hour flight uh, across and um, uh, we, we've been very privileged because uh, being Ireland, we've been able to, our, our government's acted quickly and firmly and they've uh, closed off uh, all of the uh, seaports and airports um, and uh, of course there's still uh, lots of planes coming in with cargo um, and some of course with uh, returning uh, passengers uh, who were caught overseas at the time and elsewhere uh, but they have to go into quarantine and spend two weeks in a, a quarantine hotel uh, that's managed by the uh, police and the army very strict um, and even uh, with all of those and then they get tested they don't uh, get released until they've had a clear test of their uh, COVID um, and of course that's where all the infections coming from um, so it's been wonderful they've been able to manage it for uh, uh, most people uh, like me our life is uh, completely free uh, the shops are all open uh, uh, clubs are open uh, nightclubs are open uh, cinema, movie theatres are open, anything you can think of is open um, and uh, uh, they just ask you to be a little bit uh, cautious um, and um, uh, it's been, been very, very, very well managed but it has been a dreadful scourge I know for, for many, many other people who haven't been so fortunate. So, uh, I'm sorry for you and I hope um, I hope that you're taking the opportunity uh, of uh, learning all about trading. Uh, wonderful. You're going to have the benefit of it for the rest of your life. So uh, today I want to start by talking about uh, a random walk down Wall Street. <coughs> and um, uh, as you can see from uh, this slide, um, uh, the gentleman who... Uh, uh, the gentleman who got all the credit for it, he wrote the books, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. That's not where it originally came from. It was originally a thesis that an economist was doing for his PhD, and his name was Farmer, F-A-M-A. -A. Um, and uh, he put out his uh, 1965 paper, Random Walks in Stock Market Prices. And that was actually his thesis for the, for the PhD that he was doing. Um, and um, it, it became two really... Uh, novel ideas at the time. The first one is that uh, what's called the efficient market hypothesis, which basically says that uh, everything that would affect a stock price, remember here we're talking about stocks at this stage, uh, but stocks are very important to us because of course what we trade, our indices, the S&P, the Russell, the Dow, the Nasdaq, that, those indices are all a conglomeration of, of the uh, prices of the various stocks that are in each of those indices. Um, so um, the idea of an efficient uh, uh, price uh, efficiency, uh, the concept was that stocks rapidly incorporate any information that's publicly available. Well, in fact, they also incorporate a lot of information that's not publicly available, which we'll uh, talk about later. But um, uh, these were two very important concepts. <coughs> and um, back in uh, 1973, uh, which was considerable time after the, uh, the original uh, Random Walk thesis was published, uh, an economist called uh, Burton Malkiel published the book A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Uh, uh, 
very readable guide. Uh, they're up to their 12th, maybe their 13th reprinting of it. It's been enormously successful. Um, and the basis of this uh, whole uh, theory that uh, uh, much of the market accepts as gospel um, is that um, uh, it's not possible in the long run for stock pickers uh, and Wall Street pundits and various systems to outperform the index. In other words, you can't beat the index and that's what brought about the birth of passive investing, which uh, uh, John Boyle and uh, uh, the Guardian group of companies got onto uh, uh, so quickly with their um, uh, their passive uh, trading uh, funds uh, that were called passive uh, investing. In other words, uh, <coughs> they weren't trying to beat the market. They were just trying to match the market by trying to make their uh, their own uh, individual portfolios in each of those funds uh, match the uh, market. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot of truth in this idea, but it's not entirely true. Uh, and of course, <coughs> like everything else uh, in life, uh, it's the um, marginal uh, player, uh, as my economics teacher used to teach me, uh, all of these uh, exciting things in market uh, happen at the margin, uh, at the place where um, uh, one turns to the other, plus goes to minus and vice versa. So, um, I'm, as you know, those of you who've been with me a long time and uh, read my articles, which I haven't published for a long time, but I must start doing it. There's about 70 or 80 of them on the website if you're interested. Uh, will know that uh, my pet hate in life is, uh, is banks, and in particular the big banks. And um, uh, many of these big banks are very much followers of passive investing. Um, and if you have a look at the S&P index from October 2007 to March 2009, the S&P index uh, lost more than its uh, previous gains over the last five years. Uh, that was about uh, 46,000 for one S&P e-mini contract, which was uh, 921 points it went down. That's the uh, last time we had um, a decent crash. By me saying decent crash, uh, I am, of course, a uh, futures uh, trader and a spot forex trader. Uh, and for us, we get paid exactly the same when markets go down um, as we get paid when markets go up. Uh, but the reality is, uh, the old saying, they go um, up by the stairs and down by the escalator, uh, meaning uh, when markets are going down, they tend to do it much more quickly uh, and they're very, very rewarding. Uh, but uh, back in the day, um, uh, 2008, uh, uh, late 2007, uh, very late 2007, mainly more in 2008, um, I uh, had been uh, trading with the Daniel Code for a number of years. Uh, and in 2008, actually, we released the Daniel Code website. <coughs> but um, I had a very close relationship with a number of leading money managers at one of the US mega banks. Um, and um, uh, these guys uh, refused to go short. Uh, first of all, uh, most of them, believe it or not, didn't really know how going short in stocks is not uh, as easy as it is in futures, where you can just sell a contract. Uh, you've got to uh, you've got to uh, borrow the stock before you can go short. You've got to pay a fee for it. You've got to find it. Um, and uh, it's got a cost, real cost to uh, 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 doing that. Well, they either didn't know how, more likely they weren't allowed to uh, under the uh, protocols they had in place with their uh, employers. Uh, but uh, they wouldn't even lighten their position. And uh, um, I spent, you know, a year and a half uh, telling them this thing was going down and down and down. Um, and for a whole lot of these people, it got very desperate. We had people... Uh, literally killing themselves over their uh, stock market losses. Uh, we had uh, the old stories actually true, brokers jumping out of buildings. They'd lost so much uh, money for themselves and their clients. Um, and uh, the tension going down into March 2009 was absolutely extreme. It was horrible uh, for a lot of people. <clears throat> and um, we came out with a forecast uh, back then that uh, 666 would be the low. Uh, or at least a low, probably an important low in the S&P. And of course, the market turned right at that number and on the date. 
um, and I was running a, a tutorial in Taupo, New Zealand at the time um, and had about uh, 20 uh, Daniel Code clients out there with me, uh, some of whom are still members today and are happy enough as they've done in previous webinars to uh, stand up and say, yes, I was there, I know this happened. <coughs> Pretty interesting because after it had happened, uh, almost the whole world claimed that they'd uh, forecast that, but uh, we actually did it in writing and at a tutorial live. Uh, and I can remember <coughs> we were pretty lonely at the time. Uh, no one else uh, thought that could be a low, uh, but uh, there it was. So um, uh, all of those losses, they were totally disastrous for so many people. We've forgotten about it all now, but it, it's horrible. Uh, and there are an awful lot of people, the vast majority of people who are in uh, uh, mutual funds, investment funds, all those funds. They haven't got a clue what they're doing and they're relying entirely on an advisor. And uh, uh, more, more, more often than not, uh, those guys are long only traders. They don't know what to do um, uh, in a uh, down market. They don't know how to hedge. And, and in many cases, they're not allowed to by their mandates. But <clears throat> you can read about all of this. Um, I wrote an article at the time uh, and it's called 666, the number of the beast. So just go to the Daniel Code website um, and um, uh, take a look at um, uh, that article. Um, and uh, uh, that'll give you some idea about the drama uh, that was going on um, about that low. Uh, but we were able to forecast that uh, with a high degree of probability. So. Uh, I say probability, nothing about trading markets is ever certain. Uh, but uh, by using uh, the Daniel Code rules, uh, we can increase the probabilities uh, quite extensively, uh, sometimes uh, to a very, very high degree. <clears throat> so um, passive investing, this uh, idea that you can't beat the index and you should just uh, be sitting there uh, holding a, a fund that mirrors the index, um, uh, has got a few uh, hairs on it. First of all, uh, stock indices are not the same quarter to quarter. Uh, these indices are rebalanced every quarter. Uh, and uh, what they do, that these rebalancing, they take out the weak companies, they take out the non-performers, um, and they add the hot new thing. <coughs> and uh, the most extreme example of that <coughs> is uh, Tesla, uh, which was added to the S&P index in December. Uh, 2020 and um, an analyst at uh, S&P and Dow Jones indices estimated that it would require $72 billion in additional trading uh, for managers of index funds uh, to get to get uh, balanced uh, with uh, that in the market. So they don't just bring in, uh, they take away the, the small smaller company or a company that's not performing. They don't just add one equal in weight to it, they add uh, whatever's the hottest new thing they can find. And this, this was a pretty extreme example. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, markets uh, are designed, in fact, they're engineered equity markets uh, to always be going up. Uh, that's, that's why you always see the uh, index charts rising left to right, left to right. And, and that's a very, very primary thing that brokers use. <coughs> <coughs> in talking to clients, <coughs> buy and hold, <coughs> buy and hold. I mean, if you were happy to sit through the 2007 to 2009 crash, uh, holding, I mean, uh, uh, I was going to say you're a hero, but I, I don't think that's the word. I think you're stupid uh, and don't know enough about it. But that's the whole purpose of investing is, is uh, brokers, institutions, other experts, gathering funds to invest uh, on behalf of people <coughs> who don't know much about the business. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind when you're thinking about equities and the member stocks that trade below a certain price, they're just automatically removed from the index every quarter. And short selling in stocks is purposely made very hard. Uh, and that leads always to this uh, bias of an ever upward expanding uh, market. Uh, so uh, here's a bit about the history of random walk. Uh, it's not new. Uh, some of it uh, started uh, all the way back to uh, 1863, uh, a French broker, uh, Regnault, um, and um, 
and then a French math mathematician, Bachelier, uh, whose PhD uh, dissertation was titled The Theory of Speculation. Um, so this was not a new concept, but uh, it took off uh, in a big way uh, <coughs> with the publication of um, uh, uh, the, the books, uh, Random Walk uh, on Wall Street. Uh, and a, a huge part of the industry um, is actually dedicated uh, to uh, passive investing uh, and uh, <coughs> it, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, so uh, without driving you mad, the, uh, the, the uh, model um, that was used uh, originally <coughs> to support this hypothesis uh, was that uh, the uh, closing stock price for each day was determined by a coin flip. So if the result was heads, the price would close a half point higher. <coughs> you excuse me, <coughs> the curse of the hay fever has struck. Uh, and uh, uh, if the coin flip was tails, uh, the uh, market would close a half point lower. In other words, uh, whether the market went up or not for this uh, particular project, which was done by students uh, of um, uh, these uh, uh, economists, um, uh, there were two things. First of all, the market would either go up or down depending on a coin flip. But the point to remember is it only went up the same amount and down the same amount every day. So the assumption that all up market moves on a daily basis were equal to down market moves on a daily basis is, is what this whole concept was based on. And of course, it's ridiculous. Markets don't do that. <coughs> um, and um, uh, Malkiel then took the results of that chart uh, in a graph form <coughs> uh, to a chartist, uh, whoever he was, we, I presume we know, but. Uh, it's not apparent at the moment, or perhaps I didn't go into it deeply enough, but he said, oh, that's a wonderful pattern. You should buy the market. <coughs> well, um, uh, Malkiel uh, took that to mean that um, uh, you couldn't uh, coin flip. Since coin flips were random, the fictitious stock had no overall trend. Uh, and uh, he argued that this indicates the market and stocks could be just as random as flipping a coin. Uh, which, of course, is uh, rubbish. Um, <clears throat> many years later, uh, computer programmers uh, came up with the wonderful saying, Guy go, garbage in, garbage out. And on that hypothesis, which is so popular now, it had at least 12 reprintings um, at such a simplistic model. Uh, I don't think it has any relevance uh, to reality. Um, and um, <clears throat> analyzing that particular chart is a totally artificial construct. It's not market analysis uh, because it never has a trend. And uh, in fact, all markets uh, have periodic trends and uh, a model that never has a trend where every up bar is exactly the same length as every down bar uh, has no relevance at all to real markets. However, that's been totally adopted and uh, uh, a great deal of it is true. Um, the, the world is full of uh, people, uh, fund managers, all sorts of accumulators of other people's money who are trying to beat the market. Um, and the reality is that the vast majority of them are woefully poor at it. You just read uh, Mornington's uh, summary of all of the funds. Uh, they, they log all of them. And you have a look at them on a three-year basis. Um, some of them get a hot hand. Uh, of course they can. Uh, but uh, they're never uh, very, very few, and I mean handfuls, are uh, um, successful on a consistent basis. Um, in fact, <coughs> it's, uh, it's amazing to me how successful uh, passive investing has been. It's a real indictment of our industry that the advice that people are getting is just it's poor, it's really poor. Uh, in fact, real markets are sometimes predictable. Uh, and uh, I've already told you how, some of you will know how we called the 2009, I've got 19 there, it's actually 2009, uh, crash low in the S&P. Uh, do forgive me for the typo. Uh, these webinars are often done at uh, three or four or five o'clock in the morning. Um, and sometimes a typo slips through. 
Um, and um, uh, uh, I have to say that since we started the Daniel Code website in December 2008, um, we've been able to uh, catch every significant correction without, uh, without exception. Uh, and as futures traders, of course, and also with uh, uh, Forex, uh, we trade long and short. Uh, so we expand the possibilities of profits way beyond the index model. Uh, and that's uh, one of the great uh, gifts of trading futures and Forex. So <clears throat> the oldest adage in the book is it can't be done. <clears throat> and uh, it can't be done is code for I don't know how to do it. Uh, and uh, that you find a lot in this industry. Uh, if you have original thoughts, uh, uh, the simple answer is uh, it can't be done. Um, and that's, that's a shame. Um, and that's why uh, the development of success in this industry is so limited. <coughs> so <clears throat> this is a guy called Bruce Arians. I'm sure most of you know who he is. Um, uh, he's the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the NFL team. Uh, with Tom Brady that recently uh, won the Super Bowl. Um, I, uh, I sat through all of that, uh, something I uh, haven't done uh, for uh, uh, maybe uh, 50 years since I uh, lived in the States for uh, um, uh, 18 months or so. Uh, and uh, his uh, famous saying was, uh, he said his father told him, if you want to know how to do something, ask someone who has done it. And he went on to say, of course, uh, we've acquired Tom Brady as the quarterback, uh, who's uh, revolutionized, uh, turned that team uh, right around in a marvelous way. <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, when your uh, program changes the chart, this is the uh, S&P E-mini um, since 2000, uh, since December 97 accurately. Uh, so you can see uh, we've had periodic pullbacks uh, and uh, they've got uh, bigger uh, in recent times. Uh, the uh, dot-com crash, it was called, uh, uh, lost uh, 30, uh, 3,200 uh, ticks. Uh, the uh, 2000, 2009 subprime crisis crash cost uh, uh, 3,600 ticks. And you can see just recently uh, the little screaming match we had in February uh, 4,894 ticks down, almost 5,000 ticks. Um, and uh, that happened, believe it or not, in a matter of weeks. Uh, so that's a very, very important movement. Uh, and I'm going to show you that in some detail as we go along. So essentially, trading is a gamble. Uh, traders hate it when you say that. But by definition, investing money on the outcome of an unknown event is by definition a gamble. Uh, but if you wrap it up in lots of research, opinion, expert advice, uh, we can call it an investment um, uh, and make it a feature of dedicated media plus everyday media and gloss it up with features and insights and suddenly it becomes socially desirable. Uh, and <laughs> add to that the involvement of institutions and some of those who have been very, very good at this business and they become household names. Uh, in fact, do it well for long enough, you yourself become an institution. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you a couple of stories about, of all things, racehorses. Um, and um, uh, hello, Janet, glad you joined us. Great to have you with us. Janet's a great stalwart. Uh, do I think we're going to get hit with a substantial downturn? And yes, we do. Uh, and if you go to the articles tab at the website, Danny, uh, uh, Janet, you can, uh, you'll can you see the latest article written by Frank D.B., who runs the Fourth Seal for us. Um, uh, he's got an article there simply titled 2021. Uh, I recommend you read it. Uh, so uh, back in a previous life, <coughs> um, my great passion was uh, horse racing. Uh, and I was into horse racing uh, in a big way. I had a uh, breeding start, a breeding farm, if you like, um, and I had a lot of horses. Uh, some of them, very few of them, were very good. Uh, most of them were <coughs> interesting enough to keep you uh, excited and in the business. But uh, two of them in particular uh, have stood out over the years. And the first one uh, I want to tell you about was Scomeld. Um, and Scomeld was a, a filly, that means a lady horse, 
um, and uh, a filly, you're a filly um, at two and three years old, and then uh, uh, you turn into a mare uh, once you're over that age. But uh, three-year-old is the uh, real exciting, glossy part of most horse racing's career, all the Triple Crown events in America that you'll be familiar with there for three-year-olds. Um, and uh, Scomeld, uh, who I was lucky enough to own, uh, not lucky enough, I bought her, I paid a lot of money for her, uh, and uh, she was the winner of the 1978 VRC Oaks Group 1. Um, that's uh, the Victorian Racing Club in Melbourne, and the Oaks is the premier event uh, for fillies, uh, three-year-old fillies. It's held at Flemington Racecourse, the biggest and best racecourse in Australia. It's where the Melbourne Cup is run. Some of you will be familiar with it. Um, and she was rated equal top of the 1979 free handicap um, at the end of each racing season. Uh, the club handicappers get together and they create <coughs> a theoretical handicap for every horse of that age that's raced during that year. And the top of the free handicap, it's a theoretical race because not all those horses actually get there and race together with each other. But um, uh, she was the uh, top of the free handicap, which means uh, she was the best filly of her year <coughs> that had raced in Australia, <coughs> includes Australia and a lot of New Zealand horses come over here as well. So she was a wonderful mare. That was uh, one of the highlights of my um, uh, 15 or 20 years in that business. Um, but uh, was it the most exciting event uh, that I've been involved in in racing? No, it wasn't. Um, uh, I had, uh, at another time, uh, I had another horse um, called All Rainbows. And a uh, lovely name, isn't it? And um, at the time, um, I had uh, recently put on um, a new housekeeper. Um, and uh, this lady uh, turned up at the house uh, in response to an advertisement to be interviewed. Um, uh, and she came in looking very much the worst for wear. She had a black eye, um, <coughs> uh, a little um, plastic uh, hold or a shopping bag. Um, and um, uh, she was in a bad way. And she had uh, glasses, uh, quite thick rimmed glasses that were broken uh, and were being held together by sticky tape. Um, and uh, her name was Mrs. Ward. She was a wonderful lady. She was a Kiwi, means she came from New Zealand. Uh, but she'd been in Australia for years and she'd been in a relationship, of course. And uh, the bloke took delight in punching her and beating her up. And uh, eventually uh, she'd walked out, but with uh, no money and no possessions. She said that she had this uh, plastic shopping bag and in that were uh, her clothes, everything she owned. So. She was in a bad way, but she was a lovely lady, and uh, uh, we <coughs> put her on as the housekeeper. She was a live-in housekeeper. Wonderful woman, absolutely wonderful. Um, and she was very, very interested in uh, horse racing. In fact, she'd been involved in the trotting uh, business, which uh, is similar to race, horse racing and the fact that horses do it, but that's a totally different discipline to uh, gallopers. Uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> to give her an interest, um, I was uh, buying horses at the time, um, and I had a horse offered to me that had raced in Melbourne, which is another state, the most southern of our states, apart from Tasmania. Um, and uh, this mare, all rainbow, she'd she had a, um, a flash of brilliance in a three-year-old career. She'd run third in uh, the uh, VRC Oaks in Melbourne, uh, but uh, uh, 18 months had gone by, and she'd had a couple of preparations, and. Uh, uh, just hadn't shown anything at all. They had great expectations for her, <coughs> but um, she didn't live up to it uh, with that trainer in that environment. So eventually she was offered for sale and a bloodstock agent in Melbourne called me and said, look, I've got this uh, mare for sale and uh, uh, I think there's potential. I don't know what went wrong, but she had that ability to be placed in a, um, a graded race, a stakes race, a group one uh, race, or grade one, you'd say, in America. Um, and she uh, must have some ability, but uh, she seems to have lost it. Uh, and do you want to buy her? I said, yeah, for sure, I'll have her. And uh, dear old Mrs. Ward at the time was uh, uh, in a fairly bad way, and I wanted to give her an interest. Uh, so I said, uh, would you like to um, uh, race a horse in partnership with me? She said, oh, that would be absolutely grand. Uh, so I bought this horse, and I put it in her name. Um, uh, Ivy Ward, um, 
and uh, I didn't put her with any of my uh, usual uh, trainers who were big name trainers. Uh, I put her with a uh, pretty obscure trainer uh, whose uh, name was uh, Jimmy Marshall. Uh, this is a long time ago now, folks. Um, I don't know if many of these people are still around. Uh, but <clears throat> he was uh, really uh, had a very quiet sort of sneaky reputation that he could get a horse ready for a race on the right day. So I said, well, here's one. She's uh, <coughs> uh, been a good, been a, a, a classy horse in the time. Uh, but she seems to have lost it all. See if you can um, get some of it back. So um, he went along quietly training the horse uh, and he had an apprentice jockey uh, whose name was Cyril Small. Uh, we used to call him Circular Cyril because of his uh, uh, style of riding with the whipper to go round and round and round. Anyway, <coughs> Cyril back in the day finished up becoming quite a famous uh, jockey was associated with a great horse called uh, Go uh, Go Rogue. A wonderful front running horse. But this was back in the day when he was a three kilo kid or uh, <coughs> what uh, you would call, uh, I forget the American expression, but uh, uh, apprentice jockeys, uh, early apprentice jockeys as Cyril was, uh, get an allowance. In other words, uh, because their riding uh, is not terribly good um, and no one would put them on a horse if they had to carry the same weight as a seasoned jockey, uh, they get an allowance. And a three kilo kid, <coughs> Uh, they get three kilos off the weight of the horse. Uh, so you've got a, um, a a poor jockey on it, uh, but the horse gets a benefit uh, by its uh, weight being reduced. But anyway, um, uh, time came and went, and uh, uh, we went along with this mare, and <coughs> eventually um, uh, Jim came to me one day and said, uh, I think this horse is ready to race, um, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give her a, um, a race, get her a bit fitter. Uh, which he did, and she uh, ran in a race, uh, sort of about midfield, pretty average at the time, but she wasn't really fit. Uh, and uh, a month later, <coughs> he came to me and he said, the horse is ready and I think she can win. <coughs> I said, well, that's exciting. Now, back in the days, I used to be a pretty serious punter. Um, I'd never back other people's horses, but uh, my own horses, if I thought they were a, a reasonable chance, I'd um, have a bet on them, and sometimes I'd have a good bet on them. Uh, so the day came for the uh, race for all rainbows at Eagle Farm in Queensland, and it was Christmas Eve. Um, and these days I can't even remember uh, what year it was. Uh, it was around uh, late 70s anyway, um, uh, possibly uh, early 80s. I've got all the photos and the press clippings. They're all locked away uh, up, up there in the shed at the back of the property. Uh, but... Um, uh, so the day came and uh, we went off to the races and uh, uh, here was this uh, mare, all rainbows, and she was um, entered in the uh, fillies and mares race, uh, uh, trained by uh, little known trainer Jay Marshall, uh, ridden by uh, virtually unknown um, uh, claiming apprentice jockey C. Small. Um, and uh, she was in the name of uh, Mrs. Ward. And I said, I'll put this horse in your name. We're racing it in partnership. She wasn't paying any of the bills. I was paying everything, but it gave her an interest. And I said, I'll put it in your name. So that was fine. Um, and um, uh, so the, the time came. And <coughs> when you take the gloss of media off a horse, uh, she wasn't being raced by Jane Needham. She wasn't with any of the big uh, trainers. She wasn't with any of the big name jockeys, and some of whom I had on retainer. Uh, so they put her up 150 to 1, uh, which you rarely see, uh, and that's the price you get for absolute no-hopers. Uh, and it's true that the recent form of this uh, filly for a year or more had been very, very ordinary, uh, but she still had this spark about her that in a three-year-old career she had done something important in a big race. So I started to back this thing, and the price came in from 150 to 1. I kept backing it, and about two or three other uh, commission agents going around backing it with the bookies. We have uh, live book, live betting with bookies, uh, bookmakers on track, and we also have the tote, which uh, you would call the Parry Mutual. Uh, anyway, uh, the price went in and went in, and then eventually at some stage the rest of the <coughs> betting community stumbled on this thing, and everyone started backing it. They were... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, they were running around the betting ring. Bookies clerks were running around trying to lay off the bets. That means get rid of some of the uh, bets you'd taken. Anyway, 
This thing opened at 150 to 1 and it started at 9 to 4. So 150 to 1 meant for every dollar you put on with your bet, you got $150 back. Uh, in fact, $151, you got your stake back. So it's now down to 9 to 4, which is uh, 2 and a quarter to 1. So now um, uh, you're now the favourite in the race or very close to it. Uh, so away the race goes and the last instructions uh, I remember because I was there, uh, Jim giving to uh, Cyril, uh, who was a very young apprentice as I say, probably only had five rides in the city at that stage, maybe three. And he said, don't pull the whip Cyril because you'll fall off. <laughs> so, away this race went and she was uh, travelling along nicely and coming around the turn to big long straight at Eagle Farm. <laughs> She got uh, she got uh, to the front uh, alongside the favourite, the other uh, horse that was a big chance, and they're neck and neck. Um, and on the other horse, he's got uh, you know one of the leading jockeys, and it's uh, he's slathering away with a whip. In those days, there were no uh, rules about not using the whip and certain after a number of strikes, uh, and he's just whacking away every stride, and he's riding this thing for his life. And on the outside. He has all rainbows with Cyril on it. He can't pull the whip because he'll probably fall off. And he's getting further and further up the horse's neck as we get to the finishing post. Anyway, long story short, she won the race. And uh, a bug, that's right, bug boys in America. Michael, thank you. She won the race and uh, the headlines next day were uh, all rainbows, tore the eagle farm, blessed betting ring apart with the biggest plunge of uh, whatever year it was, 150 to 1 into 9 to 4. Uh, and it was a fortune. Um, and uh, uh, I went to the settling uh, a couple of days later. You went up to Tattersall's Club in Brisbane for the settling. And uh, I had bookies handing over promissory notes, their wife's pearls, title deeds, you name it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, so uh, there's all sorts of levels of excitement out there. But uh, the thing about uh, horse racing is uh, back in the day, Betting was all in. <clears throat> if you uh, you could bet before the race, uh, and if uh, uh, the horse uh, didn't get a start, if it was uh, uh, hurt, uh, cancelled, pulled out the race, you lost your money. Um, and during the race, uh, I was going to say there are a hundred things that can go wrong, but there's a thousand things that can go wrong. Um, and uh, your horse can uh, have an off day. Um, the jockey can uh, have an off day. Uh, uh, things can happen. It can get into a a poor position uh, and have no chance, uh, or occasionally uh, worse can happen. The horse gets uh, knocked around and loses its stride. Or, um, I've had situations, of course, where uh, the horse has actually fallen in the race. Um, I've also had a situation where the jockey fell off. Um, and uh, in that case, you put your money on uh, and uh, betting was all in. Once you put the bet on, that was it. Win or lose was the only outcome. Uh, and I had had the uh, misery of having to sit through races where uh, one of my horses that I'd backed uh, had no chance. Uh, something had gone wrong or a jockey fell off, or all sorts of things. Um, uh, so uh, once I found out that you can have stops, uh, stops trading futures and forex, that was one of the most exciting days of my life because it was equivalent to having your horse in a race you put your money on, they jump, the horse misses the jump, it's now got no chance, uh, you lose your money. But with futures, if the trade's not going the way you want, you can take your stops to market and get out at any time. And I thought that was so exciting, I thought, well, how can you possibly lose? Well, of course, it's a bit like horse racing, there are thousands of ways you can lose, many, many of them. Uh, and um, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, was the uh, biggest, most exciting day of my uh, racing life was not when Scomel won the Oaks, so that was wonderful, but when all rainbows uh, got home at 150 to 1 into 9 to 4, it was wonderful. Uh, but um, that's what got me excited about futures and forex. But uh, in uh, unlike uh, um, uh, random walk theory, the reality of markets is that you can have an edge, um, and there's all sorts of edges you can have. Uh, there are many, many uh, corporations um, who have uh, involved doubles in uh, high-frequency trading, uh, and they uh, pay lots of money, and I mean big money, to locate their server as close as they can get it to the trading floor at the New York Stock Exchange, and they're getting the prices a millisecond before anyone else gets them. In some case, many seconds before anyone gets them. In fact, 
from my computer uh, to the um, CME, it takes uh, 272 different hops the last time we looked. That is, it's going through 272 <coughs> different um, links or other computers to get there. Um, and that slows down the price you get. Well, in my case, I'm at the complete wrong end of the spectrum. A change in price uh, in Chicago um, it takes about four and a half seconds to get to me. But uh, I'm no longer a short-term trader, so it doesn't matter. In fact, it never mattered uh, because of the uh, Daniel Code system. Uh, but <coughs> the that's one of the ways that you can get an edge. The other way is uh, what's been going on with uh, Robin Hood and Citadel. You can pay brokers to sell their order flow to you. Now, I know that's dressed up as being innovative, wonderful, uh, new technology, great for the business. Of course, it's not. Um, it, it's great for the brokers, and that's all. Um, and uh, a lot of these things, um, in my view, um, are cheating. Um, the idea, the basic idea of all markets is that everyone has an equal chance, that uh, <coughs> the, the market's not biased towards any uh, one individual or one institution. Of course, that's not true. Markets are very biased. Uh, they're biased by how quickly you can get the uh, data. Uh, they're biased by all sorts of inside information. It was not so many years ago uh, that brokers used, big brokers used to hold meetings uh, where investors could come and talk um, to influential people in the business. For example, a scientist um, who's running a trial for a new product, uh, a new uh, uh, medicine um, in a uh, healthcare company. Um, and uh, you could go and talk to him. You pay a fee, of course, um, but that's inside information. And that, that is rife. The whole market uh, is based largely on inside information of, um, um, uh, a grand old <coughs> broker, he's been dead a long time now, his name was Rene Rivkin. Um, he was a very, very good broker. He was an interesting, very interesting chap, Australian Sydney stock broker, very flamboyant, had solid gold uh, uh, worry beads and uh, great entertainer and uh, everyone loved Rene. Uh, he finished up broke, uh, but uh, he was a great uh, uh, source of entertainment uh, for many, many of us while he was alive. And I can remember him saying um, <clears throat> on a television show once, um, they were talking about uh, insider trading during a, um, a mini crash at the time. And um, uh, he said, oh, it's not a crash, it's a correction. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, interviewer said to him, well, what's the difference between a crash and a correction? He said, well, um, he said, a correction uh, is where you lose your money. Um, a crash is where I lose my money. Uh, very funny guy. But as he also said, insider trading. He said, uh, go to the south, uh, uh, south, uh, the north head, I should say, south head. I've been out of Sydney too long. Go to the south head cemetery, uh, and there's no activity. Everyone there's dead. They're buried. There's no inside trading. And he said, that's what happens to markets when there's no inside trading. They just don't move. And his theory was that this is back in the day before there were so many. Uh, rules and oversight. Uh, his theory was that all market moves were caused by inside trading, and I think, I think there's a good a good percentage of that being true. Anyway, uh, let's move on and get to what's the current. Uh, those of you who will have heard about the Robin Hood traders, uh, and uh, these are um, a young group of uh, mainly young, uh, very socially active people who've been getting on. Uh, uh, websites talking about short covering and, and, and forcing up stocks that were uh, heavily oversold. Um, uh, the last one, uh, GameStop or GameStock, I think it was called, had 150% short interest. That means that people had short sold, <coughs> borrowed stock and short sold 150% of the available capital in the firm, which, of course, not quite right, but it just means that one sale uh, went on to another and another, uh, still the same stock, but they don't know how to uh, take out that particular figure, or well, they don't want to. Um, and uh, this particular group uh, got on the idea of forcing um, um, a, a heavy bit of short covering. And, of course, uh, once you can do that, they get enough momentum by getting enough people on their websites yapping about it, uh, that stock starts to move, and it moved and moved and moved. And this was a stock that was trading around 30-odd dollars. They got up to about $480 because the traders who are short, they have to buy their shares back 
um, or in, in, in incur the pain. Um, and um, it's all washed, come out in the wash now, and uh, I think the stock's back at about $80 heading down. Uh, but uh, that's uh, a form of insider trading. It's not the insider trading uh, that's uh, not allowed, the really secret insider trading supposedly um, is uh, uh, against the rules, uh, but so is a lot of things. You'd have thought this whole concept of this uh, trading platform, Robin Hood, uh, that uh, lets people trade stocks for free. They don't charge a commission. Um, how do they do that? They're running a business, uh, aren't they? Um, yes, uh, and what they're doing is they're selling their order flow, their orders, they're selling that to other traders, and the main one being Citadel, very, very big, huge, massive hedge fund. Um, and they buy these orders and they execute them uh, either on a dark, dark pool or some in-house basis other than the exchange. And they, they, their justification is it's creating a more efficient market and that uh, traders are getting slightly better fills. In other words, a nano dollar, um, uh, maybe a fraction of a cent on each trade. Uh, but you'd have thought the SEC would have banned it. To me, it seems like cheating, but it's allowed. Uh, but what's happened is that those people that have been involved in that sort of a setup, they're looking for a lottery. That's not trading. They're looking for that huge hit, the once in a generation move. Um, and uh, that's not trading. Trading is about having an edge and sticking to it. And in fact, once you've got an edge, the longer you trade, the more money you make. Uh, so uh, can you beat random walk? Many ways of beating random walk. The first is technology. Talking about that, high frequency trading, uh, co-locating your service so it's close at the exchange, you get the data first. Uh, then you run high frequency trading programs. Uh, the edge of inside knowledge, uh, which I've talked about, which is basically uh, knowing something the rest of the trading world does not know. Um, and the Daniel Code is the ultimate edge because all markets turn at their Daniel Code numbers, both in time and in price. Um, and uh, it's quite extraordinary. Um, it's a set of ratios um, that I learned uh, from the book of Daniel uh, in the Old Testament, uh, which is why it's scorned and looked down on. Uh, because, oh boy, uh, you're talking about religion. Uh, it must, must, it's a scam. If you involve religion, they, people think it's a scam. Uh, if I said that I'd learnt this from an ancient document dug up uh, under the pyramids, people would be over the moon with excitement about it. Uh, but these wonderful Daniel Code ratios that come from the book of Daniel, they're largely unknown and in effect they're secret. So few people know about it. But the Daniel Code ratios can trail all markets in time and in price. Um, and you can go to uh, the link I put up there for you, uh, which is our historical charts, uh, or you can click on the chart archives link at www.thedanielcode.com. And in there, there are over 40,000 Daniel Code charts which I've created since December 2008. And you can prove it for yourself. You'll be hard put to find a market that turns anywhere except at the Daniel Code numbers. And the way they do that is very, very precise. Um, and you can see me talking about finding time on the Daniel Code cycles in earlier webinars. Uh, but uh, let's have a look at something in more particular now. So uh, this is a basic chart of gold. This is COMEX gold. Um, and that's all you see on a chart. Charts are really um, a measure of human emotion. Uh, people get excited uh, whether they believe there's an economic case for it or some other case, markets go up. Uh, the other way, they go down. Uh, so uh, there's a, a, a run of a chart for uh, uh, since uh, March 2020 uh, to date. Uh, and you can see uh, that big uh, high uh, at the early August uh, last year, and the market stopped there. It turned around, it's been down ever since. Why? Why did that market stop at that particular point? And that's the whole secret, isn't it, to having that edge? If you know that, you know more than almost everyone else in the world. And here's how you'd know. This is the Daniel Code members charts. We publish these uh, twice a week. Uh, Sunday, Monday, three times a week, Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday. 
we update these. If there's a big move that takes it off the way off where the uh, uh, Daniel code ratios are, we'll update them uh, more often than that. But I've taken you back now to August the 6th, 2020. This is gold. Look at the Daniel code numbers there. See those blue line numbers? This is what I'm talking about when I say banging the blue. We have other numbers as well. We have retracement numbers. They're in red and occasionally in black. Black is the black line is the last level of support or resistance in any market. Uh, but the blues um, are our strongest signal um, and uh, they're pretty deadly. Uh, so this was uh, way back, uh, August the 6th, 2020 gold. Have a look here. We've moved on. This is the next chart. This is August the 10th, 2020. This is straight from members charts. If you want to check this out, go to the chart archives. They're there. You can look at these charts for yourselves. They're posted uh, in the chart archives after we post them uh, on uh, members' charts a week later. Look where that high came. 208.3.2 was the blue line. Where was the high before the outside bar, the gray bar? 208.3.0. Two ticks variance. Extraordinary. Have a look what happened next. We've moved on. This chart was posted and created on the 13th of August. Look at it. There's that same number, 2083.2. It created a TO3 and a blue line cell. And that's what I mean when I talk about banging the blue. The blue line cells lead the way. The other numbers are just as efficient, but the blue line trades are less obvious uh, to anyone. Um, and uh, that market top right of that Daniel Code number, down it went. Where did it go to? Well, it went down to the next level of support. Actually, it's the red line, 1873, below the blue line at 1875. What was the low of that? A couple of ticks away from 1873. Let's move on. What happened next? This market rallies. Up it goes. Okay. And that's what this market does. It goes from one Daniel Code level of price, resistance and support to the other one. This is the S&P E-mini in early 2020. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the high in February 2020. This is very, very important. Uh, what's this? Do you think the MMs know about the Daniel Code? No, Benjamin. Nobody knows about it. Daniel Code members know about it. That's all. We're a very, very small business. We've never advertised, and uh, uh, we have a very, very small uh, following. Uh, you have to want to find us. Uh, that's part of the... Uh, deal. Uh, we don't advertise. Uh, so this is the mini in 2020. You can see there was a high uh, around about February the 19th, 20th and a low in March 20, March 23rd. This was a massive move. This move was worth some part of $48,000 per one S&P e mini contract. And if you want it, you can have 10, you can have 100. You can have as many contracts as you like. I always just quote one contract. Um, and uh, this is what happened. Uh, the market sold off $18,000, uh, had a little rally that gave us uh, uh, four or 500 bucks. Down it went for its next leg, $26,000. Uh, uh, got us long, then short again at the last, at the very bottom bar there, uh, before the bottom bar, I should say, and then uh, it started to rally, and I've shown you just the first leg out uh, for another $6,000. Those moves were worth some part of $50,000, $48,000. How did it happen? Why did it happen? If you look at that chart, there's just no reason. And that's what, what basic markets are. They're just charts that reflect price action. If you know what you're doing, if you know the Daniel Code, all of those price moves have definition and consequences. And they have the same definitions and consequences in time. Right? Let me move on and show you. This is the chart for February the 18th. Have a look at the numbers there. The blue line was at 3380. This market closed for three days at 3380 plus or minus a handful of ticks. Look how perfectly it does it. Sometimes when you get a really long move, these blue numbers build up and build up and build up. But this idea of price recognition, markets do it. You can see them do it. They'll go past the number. They'll come back and they'll close at the number. Uh, or they'll have their high or their low right at that number. I mean a handful of ticks. That's how accurate this thing is. Let's move on. This is what happened two days later. You had a little uh, one bar correction. Back up the next blue line number, 3395. 
the high of this last bar we're looking at, handful of ticks away from the blue line number. And everything else was in place. The stochastics were overbought. We had divergence on the momentum indicator. All the rules that we used to create turns in markets or orders for turns. But it all starts with the Daniel Code numbers and target recognition. We've moved on a couple of days. This is now February the 24th, 2020. This is a published chart. Someone said to me, oh, uh, uh, what do people who've been doing this for a while think about it? Well, have a look at the website. There's 40,000 charts covering 13 years. Uh, they're all public knowledge. We put them out on the website. Anyone can look at them. You can look at them. Check it out for yourself. Markets do this all the time. They turn at and only at the Daniel Code numbers. Look what happened when this market started to sell off. Went down to the red line number. Exactly. Massive volatility, lots of excitement. Unlike almost every other program you've heard of, the more volatility increases, the more accurate the Daniel Code numbers get. This is what it was like up to the uh, 26th of February. More big bars down, and it's still stopping at its numbers exactly and precisely. Not maybe. Here's where we were by the 28th of February. $21,000 per one contract in that first move down. Wow. And those bars at the top, they were a blue line and a TO3 cell. And we post these signals every day. TO3 and blue line signals. We also post the success signals, which today are late uh, because the data we got was uh, pretty corrupted from Trade Navigator. Uh, and I'm waiting on them to give us a new uh, download. Uh, some of the grains and silver and uh, crude oil were like crazy stuff. Um, uh, and this is what happens as we move on. We're still on that one big move down. We're now up to March the 2nd. Look where this turn came. This is a key reversal bar. Look where the low was. The blue line's at 2850.75. Where's that low? Low, 2850.75. Exactly. Not maybe. Exactly. Have a look what happens after that rally. There's the low. That was the low. Uh, and look where it came. 2173 was the low. Where was the low of that to bar? Uh, one or two ticks away. That was all. Where did it rally to? Up to the next lot of Daniel Code numbers. Then it turns around. Um, have a look at this as we were approaching the low. I'm past it now, uh, but this was posted on March the 23rd. And you can see the Daniel Code numbers. There they are. These numbers, these, this market hasn't locked onto its numbers yet. You can see the down bar before the red bar has gone a little bit through it. After the red bar, you've got an outside bar. It's in grey. The close is below that blue line number. Not much, but that's not target recognition. Look what happens now. This is target recognition. This was the low on March the 24th. We didn't know at that stage it was going to be the low, but look where that bar was. The close of this bar was 2216, where the blue line was. And the low uh, was right at 2173, plus or minus a couple of ticks. So we had double target recognition. We had target recognition at the low and at the close. That's pretty powerful, and that creates the blue line signal and the TO3 signal, and this is what happened. Up it goes. Where did it go? You can see it's just ticking off the Daniel Code numbers as it goes. And it wasn't just the S&P. Once we got some volatility, it spread to other markets. Uh, this was crude about the same time. I talked about this in our webinar days of wine and roses that many of you came to. Um, if you didn't um, uh, come to that webinar, have a look at the Daniel Code website. All the webinars are recorded and they're posted on the website. Look at this, $21,000 in crude oil, one contract, enormous. Why? Blue line and TO3 sell signal at the 5370 high. The close of that bar was 5370 plus or minus one or two ticks. Have a look at it. Uh, this uh, is Forex, exactly the same. I need to talk more about Forex. I started off as a Forex trader. That's why we run Forex at the website. If you like Forex, this is the place to be. Have a look at this. Uh, that gave you blue line and TO3 signal off the blue line at 13191. Down it goes, almost $5,000 per one contract. Hmm? That's what the Daniel Code does, and that's your edge.
this is gold from about that same period when we got that burst of volatility. This chart was posted March the 12th, 2020. Look at the TO3 sell signal. It's right underneath the blue line. Didn't quite get to the blue line. Showed a little bit of weakness in that market, but it did trigger a TO3 sell signal. The previous mark bar, which is not shown here, it closed right on a blue line. Down it goes. Have a look where it went to. This is a crash. This is taking out the old low in three days. The low, 1560.9 was the blue line. That's where this market stopped for the day. Eight and a half thousand dollars per one contract, straight down. This is taken from the webinar Days of Wine and Roses. Here, this was the two moves down. Some part of 50,000 at today's close on the 6S market, on the current positions, because we also trade the 6S signals, a day to day uh, signals. They tell you uh, where to put your buy, where to put your sell, where to put your stop. Sometimes they tell you, like in gold recently, when to exit. Get all the money. Have a look at it. This is also success um, uh, from the um, webinar Days of Wine and Roses. $25,000. Straight down. Two moves. 8500 followed by 15500 $24,000. Some part of it. One contract. Talk about making money. And, of course, don't forget... These are the Daniel Code ratios of time. And this comes from that same webinar, Days of Wine and Roses. And there's a lot more about time in that webinar and others. But have a look at it. There was the third iteration of a 59-day cycle. This is on the daily chart. That brought in the high right where we had a blue line signal. And that's what happened. Amazing, isn't it? Okay, so... Um, uh, I don't often talk to you about um, uh, what else has been happening, and I should, but uh, this is from the forum, um, and it's a note I wrote uh, just to show people how incredibly well uh, 6S is doing. Um, I can't show you the updated charts because we've got bad, bad data for crude, uh, soybeans, and a couple of other markets as well. Uh, but um, this market was, uh, this was just the last uh, six days. I think this was up to Tuesday's close. 26,500 in our current trades on the success program as well. Um, and we have a new uh, uh, a subscription um, uh, program for that. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's $115 a week. That gets you everything. It's called the Super. Uh, it's called Daniel Code Website Super. Uh, and it gets you everything on the Daniel Code. You start off with the long-term stuff. Have a look at the uh, fourth seal commentary on uh, gold and uh, uh, oil and the S&P. Uh, move on there to your daily trades. Then look at your success trade. You, we do 11. We trade 11 futures markets in success. Um, and uh, you get uh, all of that. You get a signal every day where the stop should be, where the entries are, where the reversals are, and sometimes when to exit. Um, so uh, it seems to me that you should uh, be getting some serious benefit out of that. Uh, so uh, we're getting towards the end, folks, and as usual, I'm eight minutes over, and those of you who are still with us, I thank you. Uh, and uh, as it says here, uh, the greatest secret never told is the Daniel Code. Mrs. Needham says that. Why doesn't anyone know about this? Well, we don't advertise, and we don't do outrageous, silly things that get you uh, uh, coverage uh, uh, in uh, uh, the rags. Uh, but uh, it is the greatest secret never told. Um, it is your pathway to success and wealth. Um, and I wonder why you don't tell your friends. I was speaking to uh, uh, William. Uh, it's, Hello, Kyle. Good to have you with us, mate. Actually, I'll get to you. Um, uh, well, I was speaking to a gentleman called William from California yesterday. Um, and, and he's a man of faith. He's very, very involved with his church. Um, and he was saying, um, he amazed when he found out about, uh, he's doing a tutorial, he saw about trading time, he's over the moon. He said, oh, this is so fantastic, I can't believe it. Um, uh, and I said, great, have you told your friends? Oh, no, I haven't. I said, you told anyone at your church? No, I haven't. I said, why is this thing such a secret? Why wouldn't you tell your friends? Because the most common thing, comment I get, is when people find out how to trade the Daniel Code, they say, don't tell anyone, it's too good. It's not going to change, folks. It hasn't changed over the 12 years, 13 years now that I've been running the website. 
we've seen high frequency trading come <coughs> and we've seen all sorts of innovation come it's never changed our trading one little bit Daniel code goes on and on forever but tell your friends please uh, if you're in a church group tell your friends uh, this probably more than any other group this is, should be for people of faith uh, and the one thing everyone wants they never talk about publicly or very rarely more money this is how you get it disciplined life a controlled life a regular source of money whenever you want it like having your oil well in the backyard you can go and dig it up whenever you want it'll never go away <coughs> here we are <coughs> so that's it folks if you want to be seriously good if you seriously want to be a super trader let me know jane needham at the danielcode.com uh, and we can talk about doing a daniel code video tutorial uh, where i will teach you to do all of the things that you see me doing in these webinars all the time uh, and uh, yeah we can take you on pretty quickly if you're ready let me know um, and i'll send you some documentation uh, and we can get you started uh, in a fortnight uh, for those of you, it's not a term Americans use, fortnight's a British term. Uh, I've used it all my life, my parents use it. It means 14 nights, it means two weeks. Uh, we can get you started uh, in a fortnight. Uh, for those of you who are subscribed to the DC website Pro, don't forget you are entitled to two free markets from our success suite. Uh, contact Terry, support at the danielcode.com. Let him know which markets you're interested in uh, and he will uh, turn you on. Remember, the business of trading is not about being right, it is about making money. Uh, for those of you who haven't already done so, you're most welcome to a free trial. Click the free trial link, link at the Daniel Code website. Uh, and uh, any problems with access, contact Terry, support at the danielcode.com. Uh, he's a very good bloke, Terry. He'll get you sorted straight away. Uh, this here, folks, is our disclaimer. I do uh, urge you to read it. Uh, and I urge you not to trade money until you are really confident in your ability to do so. It's really easy to lose money trading futures and forex. In fact, the vast majority of new traders do lose money, a lot of it. Wait till you are sure that you are a competent trader before you risk real money. Uh, and that's us uh, for the moment. Uh, folks, we thank you for being with us. Uh, the only question outstanding is from Akshay. Uh, is there any change in trend for the US dollar index? Uh, actually, I fear that this uh, new uh, administration is determined to weaken the dollar. Uh, so uh, it's down at the moment, uh, it's staying down. Uh, Benjamin, why don't I use options for my trades? Options are systemically mispriced, Benjamin. The people who make options, money in options, are options writers. Uh, they are systemically mispriced. They are so far out of where they should be. If you really understood market, it would make you shudder. Uh, futures I can get the price I want or I don't take the trade uh, and uh, futures highly liquid markets are there forex the same uh, you're not being handled by a bunch of uh, guys on the other side of it Carl I'm glad you like my racing story Sue you in particular thank you I'm glad you all love that um, and uh, thank you for being uh, with us today uh, and um, uh, we'll look forward to um, uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again at our next uh, webinar. Uh, any questions, please shoot me an email, jneedham at thedanielcode.com. Uh, happy to uh, talk to you at any time. All the best for now. Bye-bye, Murph. Bye-bye, uh, uh, John. Go for a swim. Coughs is probably beautiful today. Kyle, I hope it's a nice day over in uh, the land of the Shaky Isles. All the best, folks, and thank you, Hank. Enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>